Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Simon Fry, the consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome back to the channel and to this part two video relating to the sciatic nerve. If you haven't already seen the part one, please do uh, link up to uh, the video below uh, following the iCard above and you can see a little bit more about the anatomy of this nerve and some of the considerations pertinent to this. In this video, we're going to be talking specifically about trauma and that trauma can come from two types of places. There can either be violent, malevolent injuries, particularly things like gunshot wounds, crush injuries, blast injuries, and then there are accidental type of injuries, medical mishaps, which in technical language is known as iatrogenic injuries, which are the next biggest cause. Apart from natural nerve tissue itself, there's everything else that goes around it, and particularly uh, vascular injuries, where the blood supply can basically be cut off uh, to the nerve or to the surrounding muscles, and that can actually be quite a devastating injury too. Apart from the nerves, apart from the blood vessels, you also have the skin, the soft tissues, the bones, and any of these is likely to be damaged in the process as well, and that can have significant complicating factors, both in terms of the prognosis and in terms of immediate management uh, and the rehabilitation thereafter. Let's just start thinking a little bit about this. First of all, you know, where exactly is the injury? Is it a high injury? Is it a low injury within the sciatic nerve? We know that the higher the lesion is, the more the nerve has to regrow itself. We know that the uh, more fibers have, uh, are gonna be damaged as well. And therefore, basically, the short of it is a high injury has a worse prognosis than um, a low injury. Then there's the aspect of, well, what happened to all the other uh, tissues around it? Has there been um, burns that have gone on? Has there been necrosis tissue uh, death? Um, has there been um, infections that have set in? Is there perhaps a, a need for an amputation even? So these are all uh, very important acute considerations for anyone who's sustained uh, these kind of uh, traumatic nerve lesions because the bottom line is the sciatic nerve is a huge nerve and it needs to take a lot of uh, violence basically to, to damage it. And so it's not just about the nerve itself, it's about everything else that goes around it. Then in the more longer term stages, we've got things relating to rehabilitation. Patients will have pain issues that need to be um, looked after. They'll have uh, mobility issues. We've touched on amputations, which may, may either be immediate or may even come later on. There are also uh, significant psychological aspects as well. So there are lots of different considerations when it comes to violent injuries affecting the sciatic nerve. And we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about this soon. The other uh, group of major causes of trauma to the nerve are iatrogenic injuries, injuries caused by people trying to heal. And these basically come into main varieties. They're the intramuscular injections um, into the buttocks, and then there are issues relating to hip surgery. Now, when we talk about iatrogenic injuries, um, these are very sensitive topics for anyone who has been affected, uh, particularly um, you know, with regard to this group. Um, of course, anyone involved in healthcare um, tries to do their best uh, in order to uh, promote people's health, alleviate suffering, um, and when these things happen, they are uh, very um, you know, traumatic for the patient and uh, also for the teams uh, looking after the patients too. Um, unfortunately, with any health intervention, there are always going to be risks, and unfortunately, it's inevitable that some people will be the subject of negative statistics. And of course, we can't really go into, you know, why did it happen to me? Um, but we do know that these things will happen even in the best of hands and with the best healthcare systems available. So um, apart from the actual injuries themselves, um, there's certainly uh, the often what can be the case are issues with communication, and that's definitely a subject well beyond uh, the scope of this video. Now, not all medicines are given through the mouth and alternative routes are sometimes required. Now, in the developed world, intramuscular injections are not so common as most medications which are given away from the mouth through the oral routes 
tend to be given intravenously. Now there are some circumstances where an intramuscular injection may be the simplest or most effective way of giving someone a medication. A very simple example, a very common one, is someone who's got severe migraine, they may benefit from an intramuscular injection. And traditionally, the buttock has always uh, been a, a first thought for people because it's simple, it's, it's just there, it's large, you, you can't really miss it, as it were. Um, however, it has a particular risk of sciatic nerve injury. And if you have a look at the structures, basically you'll see that it's directly beneath it. And so the only anatomically safe place to deliver the injection is in the upper and outer quadrant. But even then there are still risks, particularly in patients who may be thin or if the needles are long or depending on the type of substance being injected or even the volume, the amount that's being injected. But the flip side to all of this is that there are no shortage of other muscles to inject into. And the bottom line is, why risk it? So um, if one can avoid an intramuscular injection, it's always better to avoid that. Um, but um, intramuscular injections are really uh, of an important cause historically in the developed world, but still very much there in the developing world um, as a cause of static nerve injury. If one has to give it, upper outer quadrant is the place to do so with all those caveats. The next group of significant uh, areas where iatrogenic um, injuries can, can be uh, caused are relating to patients who've had uh, fractured hips and those who've had um, hip arthroplasties, hip uh, replacements. Now the rate of uh, you know, reported prevalence of nerve injuries to the sciatic nerve from a total hip replacement is actually quite variable. Um, it will depend on individuals, institutions, um, how it's done, uh, but that risk can either be something as low as a, a fraction of a percent, I've seen uh, as low as 0.17%, it can even be up to 6.5% uh, from the series that I've come across. And so there's quite, a, quite a, a small proportion of people can be subject to this, but it is a significant one for those, particularly for those who have been affected. Now, there are a number of reasons how this can occur. So if we think about someone who's, for example, had a hip fracture, um, there may be an injury at the time of the fracture itself. There may be a stretch injury. There may be a formation of hematoma where blood has, um, has uh, leaked out and has formed a, a big wound and put pressure on the nerve. There may even be laceration of the nerve itself via bone fragments too. When it comes to uh, perioperative causes, there may be considerations relating to positioning of patients and also to traction pulling forces um, on the limb itself. And then if we come to operative causes, there are considerations relating to compression of the nerve that may be relating to retractors or maybe to wiring put around bones and so on. There may be laceration, whether through instrumentation or through sutures or even bone fragments. There may be issues relating to cement leaks as well, or hematomas where uh, blood has come out from it, or where there has been significant lengthening um, as well. So there are lots of potential ways in which an operation can put a risk to the sciatic nerve. Some people are at a higher risk, there are certain risk factors for this to happen. So we know that if someone's got a congenital um, malformation of the hip, a developmental dysplasia as we call it, that is a known risk factor. We know that the posterior approach um, will be a risk factor to um, causing problems with the sciatic nerve. The flip side is if you take the anterior approach, if you go from the front, then it'll be the femoral nerve, uh, which is in the line of fire. Um, and then the other uh, risk factor perhaps is the, the actual type of operation itself. Uh, for example, um, if someone is having a cementless fixation, um, that's a, it's, a, it's a bigger operation in terms of the um, sort of forces used and therefore the sciatic nerve is at greater risk. One of the most important questions I get asked to assess is prognosis. What's going to be in the future? Something bad has happened to the sciatic nerve you know, what, what's going to be. There are a number of different considerations. One of the most important ones is where exactly 
the sciatic nerve has been damaged. So the higher up it's been damaged, the greater um, the loss will be and the worse the outcome often is. There are a couple of reasons for that. The, the main one though is the higher up you go, the more nerve fibers are likely to have been damaged and therefore um, there is a greater loss to begin with. The next uh, consideration is, well, exactly how, how many nerve fibers have gone? Is there nerve continuity? Is there still a uh, skeleton structure, as it were, for the nerves to uh, regrow themselves down uh, back into their you know, original tubules and so on? And so nerve continuity can either be assessed um, either at the time of the operation with specialist equipment um, or, or after the operation, after the fact, uh, using your standard uh, neurophysiology tests. Now, in terms of what kind of injuries do best, uh, clearly a clean, simple cut with a short gap between the two ends will be the best type um, of nerve injury to repair. Um, once they go beyond a three centimeter gap, uh, usually one has to put in a nerve graft. This may either be from the patient himself, from their own sural nerve, it's called an autograft, or maybe perhaps from a donor, from a cadaver, uh, and that's called an allograft. Um, the issue, of course, with taking harvesting from your own nerves is, of course, that's another operation where another site of uh, potential um, infection, and of course, there's persistent numbness that will, will occur after that from the sural nerve being taken out. There are some advantages, of course, to taking from a cadaveric um, specimen, and um, that's all been shown to have uh, good outcomes too. Now, the operations when grafting has to, has to be required often tends to reduce pain, but actually, depending on the degree of axonal loss, function uh, or gain of function or return of function is often quite limited. I've also mentioned uh, previously, and this is quite equally for the traumatic uh, nerve injuries, that the perineal nerve fibres are more susceptible to damage and they often end up being more damaged than the tibial um, fibres. Hey everyone, I was just editing the video uh, as you can see behind me and I thought I might just throw in a little nugget of thought. Um, I have seen many people over the years who have had quite significant sciatic nerve uh, lesions and one of the things that's always struck me is the ability of those people to continue to be able to ambulate about and, and hobble around despite the fact that most of the muscles within the leg are actually innervated ultimately via the sciatic nerve. And the question has always struck me, you know, why would that be? How can that be the case? And in fact, if you really think about the mechanics of the leg, um, and if you just imagine my uh, finger over here being the leg itself, as long as we can pick the proximal part of the leg up, the thigh muscles, bring them forward, we can actually lock our knee and then be able to pivot forward on that locked knee joint. And this is exactly what happens by the fact that the femoral nerve is the nerve that goes to the muscles at the front of the uh, knee and gives us that ability to pick the uh, thigh and, and lift it up and move it forward. And therefore, even if we were to have a significant static nerve uh, lesion, we are still able to maintain an ability obviously quite impaired, but still an ability to ambulate around. And this actually would answer the age old question of embryology of how we are formed with our knees on backwards, uh, as it were, to, to the direction that they would be expected to take. Obviously our elbow joint, um, it, it folds in and our knees actually extends out. So, you know, why is that the case? And I think this could actually be the answer to that in terms of our ability to survive a significant static nerve lesion um, and to allow us to continue to uh, get away from danger and, and, and so forth. So just a little thought, which I thought I'd just throw in, maybe right, maybe wrong, but you know, it's an observation that I have. I hope you found this video informative. If you have, please do support the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing. Your questions or comments are always welcome. Please do keep them general rather than specific because as I've alluded to, it's very difficult to answer for uh, an individual's prognosis without all information. And I look forward to seeing you on the next video. All the very best.